Turn to your neighbor and say, Happy Mother's Day. And get your Bibles and turn with me to the book of Exodus, chapter 2. Exodus chapter 2. It's so good to see you. Thank you for coming out in the rain today. And um, ladies, we prayed it would not rain on your party. But we're going to have a party inside because you're special today. We're going to speak to you about raising world changers in a changing world. Exodus chapter 2 verse 1. A man of the house of Levi went and took a wife as a daughter of Levi so the woman conceived and bore a son. And when she saw that he was a beautiful child, she hid him three months. Now, let's stop right there. I've never met a mother that said, this child is ugly, God help him. Have y'all ever heard a mother say that? No, they always say, look at this beautiful child, this wonderful child. And that's where we get the saying, they got a face only a mother could love. Because a mother, aren't you glad? You got one big cheerleader in your life, that's your mama. Verse three, but she could no longer hide him. She took an ark of bulrushes for him and dabbed it with absalt and pitch. Would you underline and circle the word pitch? That's a very, very important word there. That word in the Hebrew is used all the way throughout scripture. It's first seen when God killed an animal for for, uh, Adam and Eve, clothed them. It's found again when Noah built the ark and I'll share it with you a little bit more. Bible says that she put the child in it, laid it in the reef by the riverbank, and his sister stood afar off to know what would be done to him. Then the daughter of Pharaoh came down to bathe at the river, and her maidens walked along the riverside, and when she saw the ark among the reeds, she sent her maid to get it. When she opened it, she saw the child, and behold, the baby wept, so she had compassion on him and said, this is one of the Hebrew children. Then his sister said to Pharaoh's daughter, Shall I go and call a nurse for you from the Hebrew women, that she may nurse the child for you? And Pharaoh's daughter said to her, Go. So the maiden went and called the child's mother. Then Pharaoh's daughter said to her, Take this child away, nurse him for me, and I will give you your wages. So the woman took the child and nursed him. Ladies, what would it have been like if you got paid to be a mother? Let's think about that all the hours you got paid overtime to be a mother just think how wealthy you would be right now some of your and 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 for all of us that have mothers what they're saying is their wealth is us so amen to that but verse 10 and the child grew and she brought him to pharaoh's house and he became her son so she called his name moses saying because i drew him out of the water let's pray together father thank you for your word thank you for the power of the holy spirit I thank you for what you're going to do right now, that you're going to hide us behind the cross. Lord, I ask that you make my mouth as the pen of a ready writer and that you'll do great things in Jesus' precious name. And everyone said, amen. You may be seated. It is so good to have all of you here, but we have a a very special lady with us today. And that is Jelly's mother is here with us. Sister Jordan, would you please stand so we can welcome you? Now, I have the best mother-in-law in in the world. You all have heard me say that even when she's not here. But she is known as the boss. So when you go up, say, hi, boss. Amen. (laughs) I I read something this week I wanted to share with you. Dad was approached by a teenage girl and she said, Dad, I'd like to kiss you goodbye before I go to school. And the father said, you're too late, honey. Your mother just did that two minutes ago and I don't have any cash left on me. (laughs) Uh, How many of you have uh, noticed when they cuddle up a little bit, something's coming, amen? This week we have the honor to honor you ladies and to honor mothers and all of us that have been blessed with good mothers, this is a very special day. I thought a lot about mothers, and there's a lot of things that I could share with you today on mothers, and I've learned some things this week that I want to share with you. Uh, 
every week, almost every day, Danielle sends me something about Shiloh. And I'm, I'm so glad that we have social media that we can keep up better with our loved ones that aren't right around us. But uh, this is a little video. It's just a 20-second clip. But it's, it's a little video of her talking to my grandson. Where's my baby? Where's my baby? Uh, are you in a good mood? Yeah. Yeah. Now. All, 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 the, all the ladies are going, oh, and the guys were saying, get to it, pastor. Come on, get to it. Now, here you have, you have that, where all of us that are parents and grandparents, we've done that, haven't we? But I want to show you two other pictures, if you put them up there. These are the pictures of the two young people who did the killing this week in the school in Colorado just miles away from Columbine. Now, I, I played the picture of my grandson because I believe that those two young people had parents that were oohing and on over them at one time. Now, how did they go from oohing and on to, to walk into a school and begin to shoot and kill people? Those are tragedies that we're seeming to face almost monthly now in the United States of America. And what has happened is we are now living in a culture that has lost its moral compass. The young man in that picture said that, uh, that he was a Satanist. And that goes to explain some things that took place when that situation was taking place. But I begin to think about how do women today raise champions, people that will change the world. And I was thinking about all the different mothers there are in Scripture and all the different ones that have done some amazing things. And when you think about great mothers in Scripture, uh, the first one we talk about is Mary, the mother of Jesus, who as a probably somewhere around 16 years old, a virgin, she became the mother of Jesus Christ and she had a big job and and she fulfilled her duties well. She raised the Savior who was sinless. And she was there when he was crucified at the cross. And then again in the upper room. And this lady went through a lot. She was a great mother. But then I think about in the Old Testament, there was another great mother. And it was Samuel the prophet's mother, Hannah. And Hannah was childless. And she was praying and asking God to do some miracle for her and Eli, the high priest at that time, or the prophet at that time, he, he came and kind of rebuked Hannah because he thought as she was mumbling and praying silently that perhaps she was drunk and, and she didn't get offended. She just pressed in and asked for a miracle. And God granted her a miracle and she became the mother of probably one of the most influential prophets in all the Old Testament. And if we look back into the New Testament, we could look at another man who had an influential mother, his name was John Mark, John who, and Mark who wrote the book of Mark and the same John Mark who, who left Paul and Barnabas on, on the missionary journey when there was beatings and trials going on. That same John Mark who later became so valuable to the apostle Paul, somehow his mother had a great influence on his life because when Paul rejected him and Paul wrote about him, he didn't just throw his faith away. He didn't get offended. So she did something right in raising John Mark. But I want to talk to you about a woman today who was uneducated, poor, a slave. Someone who was only mentioned twice in Scripture, once in Exodus 6 verse 20, the other in Numbers 26 59. She was the aunt to Moses' father, but she was also Moses' aunt as well as his mother. So you think you've got family issues. Hers was a little different as well. Jochebed was her name. Jochebed. Now this woman, Jochebed, was an interesting woman because of the fact that she only had three children. 
The first one, her name was Miriam, who the Bible tells us was, as far as I can read, the first woman prophetess in the Old Testament. Her second son's name was Aaron, who was the great high priest, at one, the first high priest of Judaism. He was a great guy. And then you have the third one, obviously, which is called Moses. Now, I don't know about you, but having three children, and she was three for three in a lot of different ways. Her children grew up and literally changed the face of the world. Miriam introduced praise to a culture. I mean, we hear about her worshiping and praising God. Aaron was the one who was the high priest. He was the first high priest, and he was put in positions no other man had ever been put in that way before. And, of course, we know about Moses. <clears throat> but as I studied Jochebed, I, I learned that there's three things that she did that it's my prayer that every woman, a spiritual mother, a physical mother, an adopted mother, whatever you call yourself, these three things I hope that you'll instill in your family members. The first one is this, is that Jochebed raised her children with a purpose. In Hebrews chapter 11, verses 23 and 27, the purpose was to know their spiritual heritage was essential. She didn't just leave it to chance. She didn't just send her kids to church once a week. No, 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 no. Jochebed had an intense desire for her children to know their spiritual heritage. In fact, in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 23 and 27, this is what the great chapter of faith says about Moses. By faith, Moses, when he was born, was hidden three months by his parents because they saw he was a beautiful child and were not afraid of the king's command. By faith, Moses, when he became of age, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to suffer the affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the passing pleasures of sin, esteeming the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures in Egypt, for he looked to the reward. By faith, he forsook Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king, for he endured to seeing him who is invisible. Now, Paul is probably writing that, but Paul he was, in fact, a rabbi of all rabbis. He studied under Gamaliel, and he was, as by his own volition, a Pharisee of the Pharisees. Paul the Apostle knew something about Jewish history. He knew what the rabbis taught about this great man, and he was able to connect the dots for us in the book of Hebrews. Moses could have never taken this stand without knowing his spiritual heritage. He turned down the riches of Egypt. I, I heard something the other day, and I was corrected. I offered Girl Scout cookies to, to one of my nephews. We had got some Girl Scout cookies, and he said, no, I don't want to have them, thanks anyway. And I thought, man, he likes cookies. Why in the world would he not want to have cookies? And he told me later, he said, well, Uncle Randy, they support uh, pro-choice and I don't want anything that supports pro-choice and I thought wow I didn't know that and what I'm saying to you is is that there's a value system there that he's learned and is learning and there's a value system in all of us now I'm not against cookies by the way you can tell but what I'm saying to you is is that we each devalue, develop a value system that we have to live and walk by and understand that that value system should guide us and lead us. Surely all the people knew about the bondage that they were in as Hebrew children. You see, the Bible says in Genesis chapter 15, verses 12 through 15, it's God speaking to Abraham and he promises Abraham that great things are going to happen. But he also says, you're... you're Children are going to be taken down into Egypt. They're going to be there for 400 years, but then I'm going to rescue them. You see, in the Middle East, the way they communicated history and the way they talked about their future was they told story after story from one generation to the next, and it was an important thing. I remember when my brother Muhammad took us, uh, invited us to come out and meet the whole family several years ago in Laguna Beach, California. And they had this big family get together and there's all these people there. They were introducing me to the family. And one of the things he did 
as he went through the whole family tree and he began to tell them about our family's background, about my great-grandfather who, who fought for the Shah of Iran and because he, he did so well in a battle that, our, that, our, that our, my great-great-grandfather was given towns and villages and how we became part of the royal family. He went through that whole deal right there and he told it generation to generation to generation and he told everybody in the room, he says, I want you to tell your children our history. And so still in the Middle East today, that's how they communicate history. And what was happening here was Jochebed was telling Moses, Miriam, Aaron, their history, that they weren't just slaves, that perhaps they were the chosen people of God, that God had a plan, that the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob had a plan, and that there was something good coming. In fact, in Exodus chapter 12, verses 40 and 41, It tells us the fulfillment of that plan when they were rescued out of Egyptian bondage. You see, she raised her children to believe in their spiritual promise. She told her children what the word of God promised them so that they could believe too. I don't know about your mother, but my mother was, I'm not going to say bossy. I'm not going to say demanding. And I'm not going to say overbearing because this is Mother's Day. (laughs) But she had all of those qualities that were anointed of God. And um, some of you are smiling and you're not saying amen because you're sitting next to someone who has that same anointing and and ability and qualifications and, and, and guys don't nod your head, don't smile, just look at me and say, move on, pastor, move on. But anyway, so we're, st- <laughs> we're sitting there and I'm five years old, I remember this. And we, we didn't have any girls in the family, so my mother's domesticating us. She's teaching us how to wash dishes after every Sunday afternoon dinner. We had to wash dishes and we're sitting there and um, one of us had to wash, the other one had to dry, and she put the dishes up, and she's talking to us. And that Sunday morning, the pastor had mentioned something about the rapture, and we didn't know what that word meant. So she began to pontificate about the rapture of the church. And she started telling us about the seven years of tribulation. And she told us how that when, when Jesus comes, All the Christians were going to be gone in a twinkling of an eye. And she said, in order for you boys to eat, if you're not saved, you're going to have to take the mark of the beast. And don't take the mark of the beast, because if you take the mark of the beast, your soul will be eternally damned. And she went through that whole thing. And I'm sitting there, and I asked the most important question that my five-year-old little mind could conjure up because this was important. And I said, Mom, when the rapture happens, will you stay behind and feed us? (laughs) My mother said, no. When the rapture comes, I'm going with Jesus. You boys are going to be left on your own if you're not right with God. And right then my hands started shaking. I thought, dear God, I got to get right or I'll starve to death. (laughs) What I'm saying to you is, she told me that story over 50 years ago. And I can take you back to to that sink. And I can remember the words she said. Because it made me think deeply. That night I, I gave my heart to the Lord. And it was in a Baptist church. You know, sometimes, I don't know how they do it now, but they used to want you to come down and you're supposed to shake the hand of the Baptist pastor and he pats you on the back and then you stand over there and then you go back in a room and you're supposed to say the sinner's prayer back there. And I'm shaking the Baptist pastor's hand and he said, just stand over there. And I'm left shaking at him. I wouldn't let go. And he said, son, I said, go. I said, no, I won't get saved right now. He said, well, just a minute, our altar workers will come. I said, Preacher, the rapture's going to happen and I'm not going to eat. I need to be saved. (laughs) My mother pulled a jockabed on me. And I wonder 
How many of you ladies are being Jacobed to your children? Tell them the truth spiritually. Secondly, Jacobed raised her children in an atmosphere of prayer. In Exodus chapter 2, verses 2 and 3, the Bible says that the woman conceived, and when she had saw that she was a beautiful child, she had him three months. Can you imagine what the tension must have been in the home when every time the baby cried or made a noise? Because rabbinical uh, history says that Pharaoh had sent his soldiers out looking for all of the male babies because the Hebrew midwives would not kill the babies. They said that the Jewish women would give birth before they get there. So Pharaoh started searching for the babies and sending them there. There's a story about that in rabbinical literature that suggests that that's what happened. And the rabbis claimed that when Moses was born, the room was filled with a radiant light. And that's why his parents knew that there was something special about him. They claimed, the rabbis knew that the Pharaoh's men searched for Jewish male babies every day. But they also claimed that it was the constant prayer of Jochebed and her husband and those Hebrew women that spared the lives of those children that they could because there was a crying out to God. And I want to ask you ladies, have your children heard you cry out in the name of Jesus? I I know that some of you, Pentecost is new to you and others of you don't know what old time Pentecost was but I want to tell you that I grew up in a in a church and I grew up with a mama that was old time Pentecostal and and Lord Jesus when she got blessed it sounded like a siren was going off in there like the ambulance had arrived and when she would get blessed she would go loud and low and I I, I would just cringe and but when she would pray oh my when she would pray I saw my grandma pray for me. This is how my grandma, my grandma Luke and so would pray. Oh, Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Help my Randy, help my Randy, help my Randy. I was thinking about that the other day. I still hear my grandma saying those words. Help my Randy, help my Randy, help my Randy. Help him. To be a man of God. Oh, she, she started telling me about her prayers. And one time I, she was at our home and I walked in and I, I was getting ready to tell her, come on, let's eat. And I stopped at the door. She was praying and I heard those prayers again. It did something for me. It brings tears to my eyes today to know the heritage I had with my parents and my grandparents. That they prayed and sought God for my life and ladies I want to tell you that when you lift your children up to the Lord when you begin to pray there's something so powerful let me tell you no demon or devil wants to get in front of a spirit filled mama praying for her children I mean it's it's powerful when women of God begin to lift their voices and pray for their children have your children heard you pray I remember one time when I was 16 years old, I had gone out and done something that I really shouldn't have done. It's one of those things what you do and you kind of check around and make sure nobody's watching or anything. You do what you're going to do and when you do it, you got enough of God in you that you feel convicted and you're feeling bad anyway going home because you, you know you crossed the line you shouldn't have crossed and you're going home. And I'm going home and our home in Charleston, you walk in the front door and right to your right was the living room, dining room combination and then you walk down a short hall, take a left and you're going back to the bedroom. My bedroom was all the way in the back of the house to the left and so, you know, I'm, my curfew's 11 and I know if I'm not in by 11, amen, God, my dad's going to rain the tribulation on me if I'm not home. So I know I got to be home. He, he, he's going to get, so I, I'm sneaking in, it's a little bit before 11 and there's my mama on that couch there on her knees with her head buried in the couch praying the prayer God don't let Randy ever do that again and she calls the thing that I had done and I just stood there and she prays some more 
And she prays, I don't know who those three were that you showed me. I don't know their names. But don't let him ever get in a car with them again. Don't let them ever. And she started calling all these things that I'd done. And I just thought, God, I can't do anything without you telling my mother. The word of knowledge. The word came to, and I walked through there and I just, as... As a teenager, I just knew somebody was watching out after me that was telling my mama everything that was going on. And I knew to be careful because the next day she sat me down and started having a talk. And I just listened. And I got to be honest with you, that day I lied to my mother, of which I repented. But she began to ask me some questions of that very thing. My question is, do your children know your prayer life? And then the last thing is this. Jochebed raised her children in a prophetic presence. The Bible says in verse 3, she created an ark. Jochebed had been told the story of Noah and the ark and how that Noah had prepared an ark by the instructions of heaven and how that ark had saved all of humanity and those creatures that God deemed to be saved. Of all the things she could have created, she created an ark. The Hebrew word for pitch in the ark And Noah's Ark is the same root word for atonement in the Old Testament. She did what she could do and she simply trusted God with the results. And the question is, do we? Notice with me that this woman who was a slave, uneducated and poor, she didn't raise Moses in offense. She didn't raise him to hate. She didn't raise him to have prejudice. She raised him to be a man of destiny, a man that would live for God. She raised him to know that he didn't live for himself, but he lived for others. As Hebrews chapter 11, verses 27 and 29, the rabbis tell a story that's passed down from one generation to generation of how that Moses, the Bible says that Moses said to God in Exodus chapter 3, that he couldn't talk well, that he stammered, that he had a speech impediment, that he, God needed to call someone else in Exodus chapter 3 besides Moses. And as I read this, I want to share it with you. It's, it's rabbi tradition. We don't know it to be true, but this is what the rabbis teach their Jewish children. It happened when Moses was playing on Pharaoh's lap that he saw a shining crown studded with jewels and reached out for it and took it off. And Pharaoh, who was superstitious, like all his fellow Egyptians, and who in addition was always afraid of losing his throne, asked his astrologers and counselors for the meaning of what the child had done. Most of them interpreted it to mean that Moses was a threat to the king's throne and he should be killed immediately. However, one of the king's counselors suggested that they should first test the child to see if his actions were for, from intelligence or just the reaction of a child grasping for a sparkling thing. Pharaoh agreed and they put two bowls in front of baby Moses. One contained gold and jewels of the very best in Egypt and the other held glowing fire coals. Rabbis teach that baby Moses as he was reaching for the gold in the jar that an angel redirected his hand to the coals. Moses snatched the glowing coal and put it to his lips. He burned his hand and tongue but his life was saved. And after that faithful test, Moses couldn't talk right. Moses could have grown hating people. But how many of you know that his mama told him the story that an angel saved your life? And today, some of you are here and you don't know it, but the angel of the Lord has saved your life on more than one occasion. Because somebody's been praying for you. Somebody's been loving you. Somebody's been speaking to God on your behalf. I wouldn't be here today if it wasn't for praying parents and grandparents who prayed for me and sought God for me even when I didn't want to be prayed for. I remember telling my mother, I don't want to hear about God. I don't want to hear about the call of God. I don't want to hear about any of that. Would you just please leave me alone? And she, her response to me was, fine, I'll talk to God. And did she ever? What will you do today with the destiny of God that's on your life? Would you bow your heads?